Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Manufacturing jobs in the U.S. have been in decline for decades, even though manufacturing output has risen. What's behind the disconnect? Does it reflect the impact of smart new technology, the impact of trade, or both? And are those job losses reversible? That's what we're here to talk about today, and we have two experts to do so. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. We serve journalists in the U.S. and around the world. I'm Chris Adams, Director of Training at the National Press Foundation. The topic today, manufacturing, the jobs it creates, the products it makes, and the politics that drive it. That the United States experienced a major drop in manufacturing jobs was a big part of the 2016 presidential election. But economists are confounded about what, if anything, can be done to reverse those losses. I'm joined by two experts from the worlds of technology and economics. Robert D. Atkinson is president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Robert E. Scott is director of trade and manufacturing policy research at the Economic Policy Institute. We'll be talking about the causes of manufacturing job losses, the impact of technology, and the role of the government in trying to revive the manufacturing sector. We'll also be taking questions from viewers. Tweet them at Nat Press or submit via Facebook. So welcome. So Thank we you. are going to, um, I want to start talking about the big picture numbers. I think everybody knows the big picture has been in the, it's been in the media, it's been in politics for a while, um, that the kind of stable manufacturing jobs that sustained the middle class for generations have evaporated over the last couple of decades. There was a long erosion from uh, 1970 to 2000, then they plummeted in the 2000s, and they ticked back a little bit since the end of the Great Recession. So Rob Atkinson, um, big picture question for you, you know, why is this important? Uh, an economy is constantly evolving. Um, why should we be concerned about the big changes in this one sector? Well, Chris, thank you for having me. I, I guess the first question is, um, what are the changes? And if the changes were simply that manufacturing was getting super productive and didn't need as many workers, and that's largely something to celebrate. Uh, if the changes instead were that we were losing competitive advantage in the global market and therefore our manufacturing was hollowing out, which is what I believe uh, was a lot of it, not all of it, uh, nobody, Rob, nor I believe that it was 100% of that, but it's a lot more than what the kind of trade establishment believes. That becomes a real problem for the U.S. economy for a couple of reasons. One, economies cannot thrive without a vibrant uh, traded sector, if you will. We can't, uh, in parlance, do each other's laundry. We have to be able to sell things to other countries that they then sell, they, that, that we buy. So, you know, we, when we import a, uh, a foreign car, they're not just taking our money. They, they want something from us. So that's a big problem, the fact that manufacturing has declined, that manufacturing trade deficit has gone up. That is essentially a debt, and it is a debt just as real as the national debt is. Mm -hmm. It's a debt that our children, at some point, will have to pay off, and the way they'll have to pay it off is with a vastly lower dollar, which means they will be buying fewer Toyotas and, and fewer imported things. Uh, and, and so why are we passing that debt on? That's one big reason why it's important. A second big reason why it's important is it's a, it's a source of above median wage jobs, particularly for individuals who don't have college degrees. That's an important part of our economy, and, and just sort of writing it off, which is what Washington has done for 30 years, uh, is really leaving people behind. So it's both of those things are important. It's not just one or the other. Okay, so you say hollowing out. What do you mean by hollowing out of the manufacturing? Well, when you look at what's actually happened, um, there are basically there are 19 major manufacturing sectors, according to the U.S. government, sectors like pulp and paper or steel or autos or computers. Um, 14 of those 19 lost real value-added output. Now, what does that mean? Real means inflation-adjusted, which is what you have to look at. You cannot look at nominal prices because productivity has been going up a little faster in manufacturing, so prices don't go up as fast as, say, health care. So if you look at real output, how many pens did they make? How mm -hmm. many cups did they make? 14 of 19 sectors since 2000 have declined. We're producing less in 2015, or 2014, excuse me, than we were in 2007. So we had this great recovery and all that, but we're still producing less in inflation-adjusted value-added terms in manufacturing. So... 
That's what I mean by hollowing out. Um, when you measure it properly, we can get into this discussion a little bit later, there's a huge problem of measurement in, the, in, in, in how we measure the output, which is why there's so much confusion on the issue, right. principally related to two things, the biggest one being how we price computers or cell phones, if you will. And that is accounts for almost, in fact, it accounts for 120% of the output growth. All the output growth in manufacturing is in this one little sector, which is 8% of output, 8% of, of value added. Uh, at the beginning, I tried a job, sorry. The rest of manufacturing has actually shrunk. I, I, an interesting one that's shrunk is chemicals. Chemicals. Now chemicals, okay. everybody thought, oh, we've got tracking, we're gonna, now the feedstock prices are going down for chemicals. You look at the data, it's not in the data yet. Now maybe it's coming, but it's not there. So uh, that's what I mean by hollowing up. A lot of these sectors are producing half of what they were producing 15 years ago. All right, so let's, um, I want to get a little background from you. You're president of the Innovation Technology and Innovation Technology. In information. In information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Sorry about that. ITIF. Uh, ITIF. The New Republic magazine has named you one of the three most important thinkers about innovation. Tell me a little bit about the organization. Sure. So ITIF was started in 2006. I started it, and it was designed to be a think tank that was uh, non ideological. We don't hate government, we don't hate business. Uh, and, and really, our mission was to try to advance a set of policies around uh, that are pro-innovation and, and work to oppose policies that would hurt that. I remember when we first started working on manufacturing policy questions, uh, we had an event uh, on the case for a national manufacturing strategy, and one of the attendees came up to me and said, Rob, I, I thought ITIF was all about innovation. Why are you guys focusing on manufacturing? <laughs> and it really was... Well, one of the reasons we're focusing on it because you think it's not about innovation, and right. it is about innovation. And so part of our mission is to think about how we uh, advance the innovation, and, and manufacturing is a very innovative sector, and if we lose that, we lose a lot of our capabilities as a nation. All right, and your, your funders, where, did, where does your money generally come from? So it comes really from a variety of sources. Actually, a lot of our initial manufacturing work was funded by the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, some of our funding comes from government, some from foundations, and the, the lion's share uh, comes from individual companies. Uh, although we don't, we, we will do projects for funders, for foundations and government like NIST, for example. Uh, we don't do projects for companies, it's just general overhead support. All right, so um, Rob Scott, um, I, we'll get into the whys of all of this, you know, the, the, uh, of the, the, the drop in manufacturing jobs. Right. Um, but tell me a little bit more about how it has happened. Um, who has been the hardest hit in the manufacturing decline? And 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 Rob Atkins had talked about this a little bit, but what are the definitions of manufacturing? Are we, are we talking about the steel that goes into the washing machines or just the washing machines? I mean, and can you maybe describe a little bit more about the definitions? Well, uh, I think we all use the standard definitions of the manufacturing sector. Uh, which, as Rob said, is, is 19 industries, uh, everything ranging from uh, food products uh, through uh, through furniture and and uh, and uh, office supply goods and so on. The biggest sectors, uh, probably the most important, are autos and auto parts. Uh, to go to your question, it's both the steel uh, that goes into autos and auto parts, and as well as the downstream products like. Uh, uh, electric washers and machine tools, all of the things that use steel. Um, the big categories are uh, so-called non-durable goods like mm -hmm. clothing and, and wood products and food and, and durable goods uh, such as cars and uh, industrial equipment that's used to make other things. Uh, much of it sold to the manufacturing sector as, as itself. There's a third sort of catch-all category between those two which includes things like chemicals uh, and, and other uh, feedstock items. So those are the th big three components. All right, so the um, the 19 sectors, I mean, you touched on this a bit ago. How many of those 19 sec sectors have seen, of, of those 19 sectors, do any, how many have job increases and how many have job losses? Uh, virtually all of those sectors have lost jobs. Okay. Overall, we've lost 5.3 million jobs uh, since roughly 1997. That's when the big uh, drop-off started. Uh, for, for roughly 20 years uh, before that, or even 30 years, uh, the total level of employment in manufacturing was, was roughly stable. As I think you showed in a chart you, you showed earlier, it varied between 16 and 19 million workers. But mm -hmm. something fundamental changed uh, in the late 1990s. And, and as I look at the history, uh, there were really two uh, key events there. The first was the Asian financial crisis, 
uh, and uh, the second was uh, really the growth of globalization, which propelled by things like the North American Free Trade Agreement, but much more importantly by China's entry into the WTO, and in particular, uh, the pursuit of a wide array of unfair trade practices, which allowed China to essentially cannibalize uh, manufacturing industries from the rest of the world. And they essentially uh, exported unemployment to the US and other uh, manufacturing countries. And they did it um, first and foremost by uh, manipulating the value of their currency. They, they purchased uh, currencies and drove down the value of their currency, create, made them artificially hyper competitive, made their exports cheaper, and made our goods much more expensive, not just in China, but everywhere where we competed with China. So that was the uh, I think the big and uh, single most important factor. So the Asian financial crisis of 1998? Se seven, 97, 97, 98. And so the big drop that we started to see in manufacturing jobs in 2000, I mean, right. it was roughly in the 2000s. I mean, is that those two things are linked? They are linked. Uh, the, the, the manufacturing employment actually peaked and I think in, in 897, it began to decline slowly. What happened was that uh, many of the Asian countries, Indonesia, Thailand, and so on, uh, had become heavily overextended. They borrowed too much. Suddenly, they were hit with a, with a, <coughs> a recession, and, and that led to a flood of money out of those countries, and their currencies all collapsed. And they suddenly decided they were never going to allow this to happen again. And so they began to, to buy foreign currencies to depress the value of their currencies, and so they would have a reserve of money to protect against future crises. Well, that had the effect, they discovered, of making them <coughs> hyper-competitive. It made their <coughs> exports cheaper and uh, imports more costly. So... Let me just add, add a sure. point to what Pardon Rob, me. Go Rob ahead. makes. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Which is um, what we see, and, and this, by the way, the, the sort of uh, de <coughs> deniers, I guess, I mean, we have, we have climate deniers, and I, I think right. we have manufacturing decline deniers, mm -hmm. uh, who are real deniers, uh, and they work in Washington. Uh, one of their arguments is, in fact, I heard it last night at a salon dinner, was, well, manufacturing as a share of jobs peaked in 79, therefore it's inexorable, and it's, and, and it's not due to anything. Well, that's really the wrong measure. The wrong, the wrong, the, yeah, sure. Manufacturing is not going to grow as a share of jobs because historically manufacturing productivity has grown slightly faster than non-manufacturing productivity. The question is the number of jobs. And what we see uh, over time, particularly since 98, 90, is a ratchet, which again, the argument that this is all productivity, you wouldn't see this. You'd see a gradual decline. What you see are ratchets, and they're one-way ratchets largely, where in a recession of 2001, you had a big, big decline. And then in the 2008 recession, you've had a big, big decline, and those don't come back. And that's not because of uh, not because of productivity. It's because these companies have been hanging on with their, you know, skin in their fingernails. They just can't make it anymore because there's so much foreign competition, and they go out of business, and they don't come back. And so we see these ratchet effects, and you get a little bit of comeback, but not very much. And then you know the next big downturn we have which will happen, you, you would assume we would see another big decline of manufacturing as we continue to lose competitiveness. Now we have some uh, maps, if we could pull those up, that show around the country where this, the manufacturing sector is the most, uh, uh, is more, most concentrated. And so if you look at a map of the United States, it's in the upper Midwest, it's in right. Indiana, Michigan, <clears throat> um, uh, Wisconsin, and places like that. Now, your, your uh, institute, the Economic Policy Institute, actually has a, a pretty good tool, an interactive tool, so mm -hmm. people can look at, the, look at the national map and then drill into particular states, and you can see in states which congressional districts of those states are heavily into manufacturing. And if we were looking at Indiana, for example, you can, you can drill in and see that most of, the, most of the, the, the dark, the black, are the ones that are most heavily concentrated with with you know, 10 to 12 percent of jobs being manufacturing based, um, and you can see, you know, the center of the state, they're not quite as heavy, but around the rest of the state, they are they are heavy. Mm -hmm. If you if you drill into a state that overall isn't that high, but like Illinois, I mean, it's blue, which means it's kind of like medium level, but there's a big divide in the state, and you can see the manufacturing jobs are concentrated in a couple of congressional districts, right. Rockford and up in the northwest corner of the state there. Yeah. Right, and so um, I mean, does this does this this congressional breakdown, which is one, it's a good tool for journalists to use if they're sure. covering this issue. Um, I mean, you know, does it drive the politics of it? I mean, if we we can see the 
in Indiana, the, the, the two congressional districts with the highest percentage of workers who are in the manufacturing sector, or I think it's the Indiana third and the Indiana second, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the other upper Midwest ones. And does that kind of help, does that drive the political debate in Washington, where these jobs are and who their Congress people are? It, I think it does have an impact, and I, I think that this is one reason why you find that uh, manufacturing is actually more of a, uh, an issue that has bipartisan appeal because they're both Democrats and Republicans uh, who know that, they're, uh, that their districts are heavily exposed and are heavily dependent on manufacturing jobs. And, and manufacturing jobs are just a sort of a, of a, a canary in the mine shaft. Manufacturing supports uh, roughly 1.4 jobs uh, for every job directly employed in that sector. And many of those jobs are good jobs with high wages in sectors like law uh, and accounting. Uh, and so uh, the manufacturing sector really s supports a strong overall economy. There's a wonderful quote by Gene Sperling at a conference when he was uh, head of the National Economic Council. He says... Um, he was, un was under... Under Obama. Under Obama. And uh, Gene's quote was, um, if, a, uh, if you bring a Walmart to a town, a GM plant doesn't follow. If you bring a GM plant to a town, a Walmart will follow. In other words, these are core jobs, uh, retail, nothing wrong with retail or all that, but the engine, particularly through the multiplier, is really a lot of it's these traded sector jobs of which manufacturing is very important. Okay. Now, Rob, um, I mentioned a second ago uh, the Economic Policy Institute. That's your yes, organization. Thank you. um, you're director of trade and manufacturing policy research there. Tell me about EPI, uh, your focus, your ideology, and your funders. Sure. Uh, EPI was uh, formed about 30 years ago, and uh, we are a progressive, uh, nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank. Uh, we uh, uh, we were formed uh, with support from the labor movement to to help develop uh, policies that would help uh, improve the lives and incomes of working Americans. Uh, everything from uh, you know education through uh, labor policy through social security, taking workers from the cradle to the grave. And uh, we, uh, we now get uh, the bulk of our funding from uh, private foundations. Uh, we still get some labor support, but it's, I think it's uh, less than a third. So uh, primarily private foundations and some support from uh, industry, a very small share, I think, uh, from, from industry and from uh, uh, industry associations, that sort of thing. Okay, so um, Rob Atkinson, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, drill into some in the numbers some, and then we're kind of talk about the reasons behind this decline. Um, we're seeing a drop in manufacturing jobs and also manufacturing firms are getting smaller. I mean, the, the average size of a manufacturing firm peaked um, in the, I guess, in the late 60s and they're down about a third. Why is that and why, you know, is that different than what's going on in other industries? Um, well, first of all, uh, we have a new book coming up, myself and my colleague, Michael Lynn, uh, who, who is a fellow at New America from MIT Press in the spring called Big is Beautiful, uh, rebutting the myth of small business. And we talk about why large firms on average are you know, more progressive. They pay higher wages, they're more unionized, they have better benefits and all these. But one of the interesting things in the book is we have a chapter on firm size dynamics, what's happened. And manufacturing is the only sector that saw a decline in average firm size. At retail, there are all these other firms, all these other industries have seen Slightly bigger firms, because technology enables more scale economies. Manufacturing is not. Why is that? I don't think anybody knows. There's no scientific evidence, but I think right. the, the logic and, and, and what you see are really two factors. One is that in the 60s, you started to develop what are called more flexible manufacturing systems, uh, computer-aided machine tools, computer-aided design. And these allowed smaller enterprises to get the kind of benefits of, 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 of you will, that normally scale would give the, the big, the Ford or the GM. Now you can get kind of those benefits if you're smaller. So I think that enabled part of it. But I think a, a bigger factor was frankly the China threat. So when you look at the evidence uh, that, that we have, um, from 2000 to 2014, the number of small manufacturing establishments, one to four, went down 14%, while the number of large, over 1,000 workers, in a sense, fell 42%. Those large ones are the ones that were going to move to China or close and then reopen in China. Right. The small ones are not. And so I really do think that the China challenge and, and, and the offshoring challenge in general and the lack of competitiveness policies in the U.S., has hurt the bigger establishments who have scale and, and where it makes sense to, you're, you're producing a million of these a day, 
you're going to do it in Mexico or China or somewhere. If you're, if you're making just a few little things that are customized, you'll keep doing it here. Okay. But I think there's, a, there's an important contrast sure. to make, uh, which is it doesn't, didn't have to be that way. The United States lost about a third of manufacturing employment, about 5.2 million jobs over this long period of 20 years, from 97 to 2017. Uh, Germany, on the other hand, uh, only lost about 400,000 jobs. And most of those uh, were lost in the last recession since, uh, since 2009. Uh, but essentially, their, their total employment is only down about, I think, 4% uh, in, in, that same, in manufacturing in okay. that same 20-year period. So ours uh, is down 30%. Ours is down 30%. And, and, is down and China's is up 20%. So, and, and if you look at trends in trade, uh, the United, United States share of world exports has declined dramatically in that period. We've gone from, I think, about 12% uh, percent down to eight, about 8%. Eight percent. Germany's uh, share has stayed roughly constant. And as China's share has increased dramatically. So trade is driving these trends in part, uh, which is resulting, I think, in the loss of these manufacturing establishments. So I think as, as, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, Rob, we've lost 87,000 of those establishments uh, since between 97 and, and 2014. That's the latest data we've seen. Now, does a smaller manufacturing firm, does that result in, in less desirable jobs or is it just fewer jobs? Well, oh, it's both, frankly. Uh, not to say that any individual small manufacturer, there's a lot of really good ones. I would point to, for example, Marlin Steel in, in, in Baltimore. The, the owner uh, took this struggling little steel parts firm and, and, and really transformed it through skill development. He employs a large share of the workers are inner city African American blue collar workers. And uh, so there are firms like that to what Rob and I have referred to others as the high road strategy, skills, technology, exports. Uh, but on general, uh, smaller manufacturing firms pay less, uh, significantly less than the larger firms. Some of that's unionization, some of that's just larger firms are able to be more productive and pay their workers more. So it's not a panacea somehow that we can thrive on these smaller firms. The other big problem is smaller firms export significantly less. Uh, you really do need big, what, what are called OEMs, original equipment makers, in a lot of different sectors as the anchors to really drive this. And then a lot of the smaller firms are in the supply chains, but the, expect them to be the drivers when they're really suppliers, I think, is missing the point. I, I think what's happened in part of, it, again, this last 20 years in, in the United States is a lot of really big firms, not the 1,000, but the 10,000 employee firms, like the big steel mills and right. so on. Uh, have gone away. The ones that have survived have many, many fewer workers, and now they're in a much smaller category, so a thousand or even less uh, workers. And so there's been what's happened is we've outsourced, uh, as Rob said earlier, the most labor intensive parts of production to Mexico or to China, and what's left are the, of, of some of the high skilled uh, jobs. But, uh, but again, it didn't necessarily have to be that way. Uh, Germany's retained large uh, shares, large plants, and uh, uh, and, and the large uh, shares of world export markets, and, and they've done it with even higher wages than we have here in the United States. So it's not just the, the wage problem. Yeah, I would just add to that, the German fully loaded wages are about 40, 45% higher than the U.S. Right. in dollar denominated terms, and yet they're running a trade surplus with China. Okay. How do they do that? I was talking to a German engineer once on a plane with a fairly large company, and uh, he, he said to me, you know, I said, don't you offshore everything in China? He said, Offshoring is our last choice, and we have to do some of it. Uh, but what we do first is we go with our engineers and our labor unions, and we figure out how can we get the beat the China price through re-engineering and investment in our skills. They have great apprenticeship and technology. If you look at the U.S. Uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, U.S. manufacturing capital expenditures. You know, buying machines, tools, fax machines, you name it. Right. Uh, it went up on average about 30 to 50% a decade. So the amount of capital stock went up. In the 2000s, zero, zero growth. So our companies just weren't investing. They, 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 were, they were disinvesting, if you will. They weren't buying the newest machine tools and other kinds of equipment. The Germans were, because they, they kept that commitment. Okay, so we're gonna get into some of the why on this, but before we get there, um, first, I want to remind our viewers that if you want to ask a question, you can tweet it to us at Nat Press or submit it via Facebook. And when we get these questions, we'll work the, them into the conversation as, as uh, uh, quickly as we can. And I also want to give you a chance to mention your book again. You said it's, it's coming out. What's the title again? And uh, it's coming out in April from MIT Press. It's called Big is Beautiful, uh, Rebutting the Myth of Small Business.
Okay. All right. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. So let's get into the why of all this. Now, there's a big debate about who who's to blame, robots or mm -hmm. other countries. Uh, let me just read some recent headlines. Are robots or Mexicans to blame for U.S. job losses? Robots have been taking American jobs. The long-term jobs killer is China. I'm sorry, the long-term job killer is not China, it's automation. And why robots not trade are behind so many factory job losses. Uh, Rob Atkinson, um, so ro robots and other forms of automation have a big impact on manufacturing. Uh, one of those articles from US News and World Report cited research that found roughly three jobs have been el eliminated in the US for each individual industrial robot introduced into the labor market. So are the robots the cause of these big job losses that we've seen? I know it's a simple question uh, with a complicated yeah. answer. It's not, it's not a complicated question or a complicated answer. The, the, the answer is what, what I think is frustrating for myself and, and maybe Rob is you have these people out there with sort of this Manichaean view of the world. It's either robots or it's trade. And uh, if you don't agree that it's all robots, somehow you're, 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 this, uh, you're this protectionist. The reality is when you really look at the evidence in a careful way, the evidence is, I think, compelling that it's somewhere in the half to, you know, it could be 40, 50, 60 percent, depending on the study, of the manufacturing jobs from 2000 to the present were lost due to trade, due to loss of output. Certainly, there's no question that historically and going forward, we're going to have relatively fewer manufacturing jobs from the productivity effect, because producti productivity in manufacturing has always been higher than in non-manufacturing. You just need fewer people. But where the sort of trade establishment goes from that is they, well, obviously, ipso facto, it accounts for all of it. Now, the study you're referring to is a study by uh, Darren uh, Asagemblu, I believe, at MIT. The problem with Darren's study is he looks only at particular labor markets and says, Ro ro robots who were adopted more there had an effect. But they don't, what he doesn't look at is what's the effect of that on all the overall supplier chain, the overall amount of job. He only looks at it in each little thing, each little district. Okay. Second problem with that is if you look at the robot adoption, it's 10 times higher in autos. So what he's really looking at is the auto industry. And there's no question the auto industry has lost jobs, but he's conflating that jo loss of jobs from robots he doesn't incorporate the fact that there are just fewer auto companies and auto production. It's been, some of it's gone to Canada, a lot of it's gone to Mexico, and a lot of it's gone to imports. So I just don't really buy that study. I, I think the reason, by the way, the, the very important reason why I think so many journalists get this wrong and so many other pundits is because when you look at the data, they look at the top line data. Rob mentioned I did the 19 different NAICS sectors, and that NAICS. all. The, the North American Industrial Any, Classification right, Codes. Okay. They're 19 industries. And that all populates up to one, which is called manufacturing. And when you look at manufacturing output, and then you say, okay, what's output, and then how does it compare to GDP? What you see is that over time, it's gone up. So how can it be trade if that number's gone up, right? It can't be. Right. The reality is those numbers are vastly overstated by the U.S. government. And the U.S. government, the Bureau of Economic uh, Analysis, will admit that. And they're overstated in two big ways. One is what's called import price substitution bias. So as American companies offshored, they had, uh, you know, they, they had this cup and, and, and now the handle was really cheap because it, they got the handle from China. The government thinks that the output of the cup part went up because the input went down. So they, and the government admits that they, they, they mismeasure this because they don't have staff over in these countries to measure this right. They can measure all that in the U.S., they can't. So as more imports have gone up in the supply chain, they overstate output. The bigger factor is what's called uh, NAICS 334, which is the computer and electronics sector. The government thinks that output went up 500%. Mm -hmm. So we're making five times more computer. The overall manufacturing output went up 6%. In the U.S. economy, okay. and they say this one sector went up 500 percent. So it is so big; it's this. It's not an elephant. It, it, it's like a dinosaur, a brontosaurus, and it accounted for that overstatement. And the reason why that's overstated, by the way, is they use what's called hedonic pricing. So if your computer got doubled in speed in the next 18 months from Moore's law, they think you made two computers. Right. And Moore's law was progressing, and so it, it was. It's such a big distorting factor that when we analyze it. And we say, okay, we'll assume it went up 50% output, which I, do, I think actually output went down because the trade deficit computers went down. The number of boxes that were actually shipped, you can see the number of these things that were actually mm -hmm. shipped went down 50%. So fine, we'll assume it went up 50%. 
When you do that, it turns out that that overstates output in manufacturing and in the U.S. economy, and the overall U.S. GDP growth in from 2000 to 2012 was overstated by 25%. So you want to know why wages haven't gone up? You want to know why people feel sort of less optimistic even in the GDP number? Because the GDP number is false. So that's how big a problem this is. We're, 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 we're flying blind because we think GDP went up 16%, actually went up 12% when you measure it. Now, I think there's another piece of this story, sure. which I, I think helps explain what's going on. Um, we, we've had productivity growth for generations in manufacturing, and as, 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 as Rob has pointed out, it's been, it's, it's been higher and con continues to be higher in manufacturing than other sectors, because investment uh, is higher, uh, you get uh, higher rates of growth in, in output per worker because of that. Um, but um, what, what changed uh, after 2000 is we still had relatively high productivity growth, but we had, as Rob said, we had less growth of demand. So between 1990 and, and 2000, uh, productivity or output per worker increased about 4% a year, and the demand in real terms for domestic goods increased about 4% a year. Um, and then after 2000 through 2014, last 15, last time I looked at these numbers, um, productivity growth actually slowed down to from about 3.7 to 3.1 or 2 percent, and uh, in fact, it slowed even more since the recession. Um, but the rate of growth of demand was much slower, and that's not even taking into account uh, the pricing problems that you mentioned. Just taking the published figures, the rate of growth slowed down. So what changed? It's not the productivity has accelerated. Right. It's not that we're buying more robots. It's that the rate of growth through demand has slowed, and in fact, that is in fact uh, overstated. So um, and that's the, due to trade, and that's due to trade. And, and I actually put more weight on trade than I think than you do. Uh, I think trade is probably responsible for at least two thirds to three quarters of the job loss. The other major factor is simply that our overall economy is growing much more slowly since the Great Recession in the last decade. It's been the worst decade or two decades for growth uh, that we've seen in this country for the last probably 75 years. Okay, so I want to make sure I got this right. So the, the, of, of, uh, the manufacturing jobs that are lost, you, you put the share due to trade at 40, 50? No, I was saying the people who are more, I would argue, objective and willing to look at the evidence, yeah. those estimates tend to be in that range. Our official estimate is 60, right? You're, you're, okay. ITF's yeah. estimate is 60 from our analysis. Uh, but the point, whether it's 60, 65, 50, not really the point. The point is, it's pretty big. It's, it's pretty big, it, it's and pretty it's, not, big. it's not all robots. It's, no, it's it, mostly trade, in your opinion. Yeah, yes. And then and, and, and there's some people who will say, well, we'll, we'll grant you that it's some, and, and we'll say 7%. Mm -hmm. Well, that's de minimis and nobody cares. If it's bigger than that. It's at least 50%, and that's a big number. And you guys think it's two-thirds? I think it's, it, again, 60%, 60 two-thirds. But I think you, you also have to include the slowdown in the economy. I mean, we said it's not the demand for manufactured goods is not growing. Well, one of the reasons it's not growing is because the overall economy is not growing. The reason for that is that we simply did a terrible job uh, in administering uh, or managing the overall economy, uh, particularly on the government spending side. Government spending did not increase adequately, and hence we did not grow as rapidly as we have uh, coming out of other recessions. For example, the Great uh, Recession in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan, much more rapid growth in that era, precisely because the government spending went up much faster. So, the, so in, in, the last, um, in the last 10 years, has, has output gone up, and what's the, what's the best way that that's measured? So, um, it, it, the best measure is still the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the Department of Commerce. Uh, they have, uh, you can go onto their website, look under the, the industry tab, and, and you can find, a, get, download an Excel spreadsheet, which has, and, and you need to download the real value added, not, mm -hmm. not nominal, so that's what you want to measure. And you can look at that. Um, the sector-based one is usually a year behind, so I still think we may be at 15 now for that. You can get right. overall at 2016. Right. When we looked at this last, we looked from 2007 to 2014, and real value added output of all manufacturing, leaving in the bias numbers, the, the, the overstatements. The overstatements due yeah, to computers. Due to computers. Right. Leaving those in, we were still producing less by, by, by about 1% 
in 2014. And that goes really to two points. Rob's point about the very weak recovery and anemic recovery, which is sort of bicausal. It's hard, partly weak because we were losing right. our competitiveness. And, uh, so we were losing our competitiveness after the recession, and we had weak recovery. So we were, you know, we we're down a percent since 2007. Now it's probably come back since then, but you know, it's 10 years. Mm -hmm, 10 right. years of basically no growth in manufacturing, despite what you have are people, you know, like the, the, the Boston Consulting Group who wrote a report saying, you know, we're poised for this reshoring renaissance. The evidence has suggested we haven't seen it yet. We might, but we haven't seen it yet. Right. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the perceptions of this around the country. You wrote in 2015 that there's a widespread misperception that rapid productivity growth is a primary cause of continuing manufacturing job losses over the past 15 years. Instead, job losses can be traced to growing trade deficits in manufacturing products prior to the Great Recession, and then the massive output collapse during the Great Recession. So you kind of talked about the second half of that a minute ago. But talk to me about the widespread misperception. I mean, why, why does the public I, you know, believe that the, the driver of this is increases in productivity as opposed to trade? I'm not sure what the public believes. The public okay. actually believes that trade has cost jobs. Uh, the surveys show that quite convincingly. I think that the, uh, that the economics profession and the, and the commentariat, and the journalists in particular, uh, seem prone to buy into the notion that it's robots. They look around and they see, well, look at these phones we get every two years are newer and fancier. There must be productivity growth here. Mm -hmm. This must be having some effect on the economy. We're moving towards a jobless economy, people say. I, I, when you look at the facts, this is just not true. In fact, productivity growth has slowed down uh, since 2000. How can productivity growth be the cause of this huge phenomenon, the loss of a third of manufacturing jobs, if productivity growth is slower today than it was in the 1990s? Clearly something else is going on. But I think the, the, the second reason why this view is, I think, widespread is that it's, it's convenient because it allows us, allows economists, for example, to say, oh, it's not trade, it's productivity that's causing job loss, and therefore we should continue to expand trade, negotiate these trade deals. Uh, and, and we haven't talked about causes yet but uh, in, in great detail, but what's underlying is uh, the growing trade deficits. But I think trade deals have been part of the problem bad trade deals, and uh, this is one of the things that Trump has actually stumbled into, where I think he's actually onto something. I think the trade deals have been costly, uh, and much of the economics profession uh, disagrees with that. They have a mm -hmm. view that any kind of a trade deal is a wonderful thing because it reduced tariffs and trade barriers. It must be great for the economy. So, so by saying the problem is technology, you create space for this uh, trade li liberalization uh, argument. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about about the the political landscape. I mean, mm -hmm. what describe for me if you could either one of you what is the political landscape today on on the trade versus robots debate and and are traditional right left democratic republican factions being kind of splintered on this? Well, I think we actually now have three factions. I think we have the White House and the administration which at least on the surface is taking the view that uh, Trade is a problem. Bad trade deals are a problem. And you have a, a U.S. trade representative, Bob Lighthizer, who's uh, going out and trying to renegotiate the NAFTA agreement. They've now suggested they're going to try and maybe renegotiate the Korea trade agreement uh, or even do away with it and may even go look at uh, changes to the World Trade Organization as well. Uh, so they're taking a very aggressive approach saying that trade is the problem. Uh, I, I have problems with the way they're doing that. They seem to be targeting countries like Mexico, which are a small part of the problem, rather than China, which is the big part of the problem, and Japan uh, and Europe, which are the, those are really the top three countries that, that are the destabilizing uh, world trade. Japan, uh, 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 China, and Europe. Those are the, they have the very biggest surpluses. And uh, so, so we should be focusing on those, but we're not, but, but that's where, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the Trump administration is going. I think in the rest of Washington, I think Democrats have become very skeptical of the, of the, the uh, uh, alleged benefits of the, uh, these uh, free trade and investment deals, which is what they are, uh, because they've led to job loss and even more importantly, downward pressure on wages. I think Demo uh, Republicans by and large still support that agenda. And I think if Trump wants, for example, to back out of NAFTA, he may find it very hard to do uh, given the, the proclivities of his own caucus. I would add, I think a lot of this, some of this is political. Some of it, I believe, is that 
a lot of the people in Washington who are involved with the trade establishment, uh, if you will, the folks over on Massachusetts Avenue in the, the trade think tanks or the foreign policy think tanks, um, they really have spent their career uh, on a single idea, which is Ricardian trade theory. So under Ricardo, there was this view that Portugal... Who is Ricardo? Pardon? Who is Ricardo? Ricardo was a um, famous uh, economist. He was sort of a... You had Adam Smith and then the big next con, big famous kind of in the eighteen okay. twenties, I believe. Yeah. David Ricardo. David Ricardo wrote a famous uh, book uh, on and uh, talked about. He used the iconic example of Portuguese. Portugal sells wine to Britain, and Britain sells uh, textiles back, and it's a net benefit no matter what. Right. Uh, and so this really is a core part of the religion. It is a religion for these people that trade has to always be what's called Pareto optimal. These two sides are open, are voluntary. So it has to be good for us and it has to be good for the other side. And so when they look at what happened with the Trump election, they simply are unwilling to believe that this had to be sort of in, in Marxian terms, false consciousness by the proletariat. Uh, that, that if we just talk louder to them that trade is good and we give them a little bit more trade adjustment assistance, then everything will be hunky-dory. What I think Trump is exposing is the fundamental flaws of that view and saying that, no, wait a minute, when you're dealing with other countries that have put mercantilism at the core of their economic strategy, that that is not welfare maximizing for us. So, you know, trade with Canada, you know, they're not mercantilists, we're not, you know, we, we might have a dispute over uh, aerospace or about lumber or whatever, but fundamentally it works quite well. Right. It's in our, both our mutual benefits to expand that relationship. Trade with China, it's not, because they're not playing by the same rules. So what Trump is exposing is that you can lose I don't want to speak for Rob, but I am a globalist. I think that global trade is really, really good, but has to be based upon a rules-based, market-based system, not government distortion. And as long as it is, which it is, and the U.S. is unwilling to fight that fight, we're going to continue to lose. And so I think I do give the Trump administration credit. I agree with Rob 100%. I don't think NAFTA is the, the fight to fight. Uh, China is the fight to fight, and hopefully they'll get around to that. All right. So I want to, uh, we, we, we're starting to run short on time here. I want to talk about what's coming next, both in in terms of manufacturing changes and then in terms of government policy. So Rob Atkinson, um, you, you've written about a lot about smart manufacturing and the industrial internet of things. Um, are these gonna usher in a new wave of automa automation and efficiency or is that too far out in the future? Or? Well, I think we don't know yet, but there's, there, there clearly is a suite of technologies or a technology system, if you will, that is being developed that has the potential to have significant positive benefits to manufacturing, particularly durable goods manufacturing, parts things. Because what the internet of industrial internet really is, is that every part is on the internet. Every part has intelligence. So a manufacturer will have complete knowledge of where everything is. You know, there's one uh, that we, we wrote a recent report on smart manufacturing. I can't name the forget the name of the company. But they now know in real time tolerances on the parts they make to up to 100 thousandths, uh, thousandths of an inch. I mean, wow. this is real, and real breakthroughs. Now the problem is if you look at manufacturing productivity over the last 10 quarters, it's negative. First time, in, I would argue, first time since the formation of the republic if we right. had kept that data, that's mm -hmm. ever happened. Yeah. So smart manufacturing hasn't happened yet, but it could. Now I think one of the biggest risks there is you go around the world, Korea, China, Europe, Japan, they all have very well-funded, very strategic smart manufacturing strategies. They want to help their manufacturers adopt. We don't have that. We're just saying, well, they'll adopt it. And so far they haven't. Um, so I believe it could be a very important tool for U.S. manufacturing to regain its competitive position in the world, but it's not going to be an effective tool without a smart manufacturing policy. And, and even under that, would it, is it still years away or tell us it could be a... No, I think it's more like a couple of years away. It's, okay. not, it's not like robotic cars, you know, self-driving cars, which are, I think, 10, 50 years away. Right. These technologies are already being deployed in the best and most forward-looking manufacturing companies in the world. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think in another couple of years, you'll see these, all, you know, all the little things shake out and figure out how to use it effectively. So I, I think we will start to see these. But again, part of it is our, you know, do we have the policy, particularly in the SME sector, the small and medium-sized enterprises, which tend to lag. You go to a country like Japan, they spend 40 times, four zero times more than we do as a share of GDP, helping their SME manufacturing sectors adopt these technologies, train their workers on them. 
Um, you know, we have a very effective program at, in, at the National Institute of Standard and Technology called the MEP program, Manufacturing mm -hmm. Extension Partners. Its budget is the same as it was 20 years ago. All right. So, and, and it's targeted for extinction. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I, we have a question here from Facebook, and then we'll come back to some other questions. But from, from Facebook, um, what are some bright spots in the manufacturing industry in terms of job growth? Uh, are you thinking so long because there aren't any? Or? I think it tr depends critically on public policies. Yeah. I think that we have an opportunity today to rebuild American manufacturing, uh, but it's going to take a, a coherent set of strategies to, to, uh, to, to increase output. Mm -hmm. And for me, there are, th there are three elements involved. Uh, one, I, I think we have a tremendous problem with trade. Uh, we've been running, as, as Rob uh, said, said earlier, we've been running huge trade deficits for two decades. Uh, the trade deficit in manufacturing now runs about $650 billion a year. Those are goods we're buying from other countries uh, rather than producing them here ourselves. If we can rebalance trade with China and Japan and Europe, uh, we could increase demand for U.S.-made manufactured goods. That would increase output. It would increase demand for workers. It would increase demand for capital. Give us opportunities to invest again in manufacturing enterprises. Uh, the second thing we've got to do is invest in infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure will create some of this demand for the new eco economy of uh, the Internet of Things. It, it will use, uh, smart infrastructure will use the, t the capabilities that these new products will, will, uh, will allow. The third thing we can invest in is clean energy. Right. Uh, again, that will create demand for more manufactured products. So we need an integrated strategy to rebuild uh, our productive side of our economy. And that's, I think, what that's we're Sorry, I, I yeah. just say quickly, we, we issued a report in January of this year on a, uh, 10 principles for a Trump manufacturing strategy. And one right. of the principles was we really shouldn't expect the, the sort of commodity-based, low-wage, low-skilled workers coming back. It's just not. Right. At the margin, maybe. But it's going to be in more advanced, complex kinds of production. We, you know, certainly autos could come back, right. specialty steel, specialty chemicals, bi biologics and pharmaceuticals. Uh, machine tools. It's going to it's going to be work that's complicated that 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 a, a low wage, low skilled Chinese worker can't easily do. Now the problem there, though, again, is we haven't made the investments in upskilling of the workers. The companies haven't made the investments in the R and D and all. We could if we put our mind to it. So um, so those are that's how we could lead to some some bright spots in the future. I think the question was, are there any bright spots right now? I mean, in in the last ten years, are there of those 19 categories, are, have there been any that have shown, shown some growth? The, the major thing that's happened in the last 10 years is we lost about 2.2 million jobs in manufacturing, mm -hmm. and we recovered about half of those. Okay. And most of those were in the auto sector. We had a major collapse in autos that led to some bankruptcies, and the firms were uh, recapitalized, and uh, they, they rebuilt, and so they did recover some jobs. But there's an underlying trend, which is that the U.S. Uh, based auto producers have suffered declining share of the market for at least 20 years, and that's led to a steady progressive uh, decline uh, in employment in that industry. And so there's been recovery, but not to the levels we had before. Uh, and that was the biggest single industry, I think, affected by the downturn. I think aerospace is one where we do that's quite well. True. Uh, Boeing okay. and uh, is a dominant player. And then, so aerospace actually is an area where the real output, where the output growth is real. Uh, it's right. one of the few where we have real output growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet that's at risk because the Chinese have, been, have invested, if you will, subsidized their domestic aerospace industry to build a competitor, direct competitor to Boeing. And I guarantee you, because about 95% of all planes in China are bought by state-owned companies, they will be buying Chinese planes because they'll right. be forced to. Uh, so the future even there, uh, I, I think, is, is problematic unless we act. We're, we're also exporting more chemicals and refined petroleum products. Uh, uh, you know, these things, however, are going to create very few jobs. They will create output, right. uh, create bigger firms, uh, but those firms are very, very capital intensive. They don't employ many people per million dollars in output. Especially food production is an area where we've done pretty well. What, then what is that exactly? <laughs> well, uh, my, one of my friends, for example, is the CEO of Honest Tea. You know, the okay. tea. Right. And, you know, the, the, he's not going to make that in China. 
Right. You know, he makes yeah. that here, I think, in Pittsburgh or someplace like that. Yeah, uh, cold press coffee is another one. I friend yeah. of mine does that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a, a real sort of resurgence. If you, you know, especially beer. You know, we're craft doing, beer, we're doing beer. great on craft beer, but we, right. we are doing. But uh, yeah. it's funny, people. Uh, the reason we're doing great on craft beer is actually because Carter deregulated uh, that more than first any other country in the world, and, and we got a head start on that. That's mm -hmm. actually a lesson here: mm -hmm. American entrepreneurialism, uh, demanding customers, the right regulatory framework, and, and we lead the world, frankly, in craft beer. Okay. <laughs> All right, we can be proud of that. Yeah, we should be. Um, so you've mentioned that the government's manufacturing policy needs to get the four T's right. Um, explain what that means. You're talking about trade, trade tax, technology, and talent. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about so that. So we're here. not going to, there's no single silver bullet that's going to solve this problem. Uh, our belief is we need to have uh, policies in there. So let's say on the tax side. Um, Big debate right now as we speak uh, on on the corporate tax bill. Uh, there, excuse me, on the on the tax bill in the House and the Senate. But there's a nice study by the National Bureau of Economic Research that looks at the effective tax rate of U.S. manufacturers compared to our top 13 or 14 competitors, and we're the highest. We're the second highest, but then Japan lowered the rate. So, our view is the tax issue is real, uh, and what I would do with it is I would expand the research and development tax rate. About 75 percent of R&D is in manufacturing. We have a very anemic credit compared to our competitors. I would put in place some kind of investment tax credit or at least some kind of uh, accelerated depreciation. I would put in place a, a, what we call a knowledge tax credit, which gives companies a credit for training their workers, their shop mm -hmm. floor, their frontline workers. We don't really do that. So I think you could do that. That would give companies both a lower effective rate, but at the same time, given incentives to build do the building blocks, which is R&D skills and machinery and equipment and software investment. Secondly, on the trade side, I fully agree with Rob, we have to aggressively challenge foreign mercantilist practices, uh, currency manipulation, forced tech training. I mean, a lot of these companies, some of them move offshore for because they want to. Some of them move offshore because it's the only way they can get access to that market. That is wrong. WTO doesn't stop it. On the skills side, uh, you look at a country like Austria or Germany. Austria is a good example. They have 26 centers around the country where they have the most up-to-date, the, the technology in these training centers is as good as the best company in Austria. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., these, where our workers are 20-year-old technology they're getting trained on. So they have a system where they train these workers uh, partly through apprenticeship uh, on really great technology. We don't do that in the U.S. And finally, on technology, um, you look at other countries, you look at a country like Korea or Japan, uh, Germany, they're, they're investing 10, 20 times more in R&D related to industrial competitiveness. Our R&D is related to defense and health. Some of that has spillover effects, but you know we need big R&D programs in machine tools, in robotics, in, in better steel, and all these things. And we, can, we made some progress under the Obama administration with a program that Congress passed called the Renew America's Manufacturing Act, which led to the creation of these Manufacturing USA centers. Really, really great program. These are public-private partnerships. There's 14 or 15 of these centers now around the country, one on 3D printing, one on uh, uh, biological things. But they're very underfunded compared to what the Germans do or the Japanese do. So we've got, a, we've got now an infrastructure to do these kinds of things, but we need to really ramp it up. And uh, given the budget problems and the, some of the ideologies around the role of government, it, it could be problematic. So those, those public-private partnership centers, what are they called again? Uh, they're called Man Manufacturing USA centers, um, and there's 15 or 16 around the country. And they're, they're really, they're, there's one in Detroit on lightweight materials. And making these things lighter is, is, and stronger is going to be an important component. And um, Okay, well, why don't companies do that? Companies don't do that in the U.S. because, number one, those are risky things. They're, they're mm -hmm. trying to deal with what you know, some people call quarterly capitalism. And, uh, and these are five-year bets, ten-year bets. And so if the public comes in and says, by the way, we're going to help all the competitors work on this in a pre-competitive way, and we're going to put in a third to a half of the money, these companies will, will step to the plate, and they'll help develop these technologies. And then they have a buy-in because they're like, oh, I help develop. I'm going to use it in my own company. This is a very well-tested model. The Germans have been doing this for 60 years. They have 60 centers in their front offer system. We're just beginning to start, but uh, we could do more. And is it is there a shelf life to these centers? Or it, how how long do they have funding for? And so one of I well, I think one of the big problems is that the shelf life is way too short. I believe they have funding for five years. You know, but the, the way these work, the first two years you just sort of get and everything. We're up. You maybe got two years, and then you have to go out and start scrounging for money, all from industry. I don't think it works. Industry, right. there are spillovers, what economists call spillovers. The German system is better. The German system is a third of the money comes from government. 
They're very, very rigorous though. If industry's not putting up the money, they kill a center. They kill centers regularly and they create new ones. So it's very industry led, but they understand that there has to be some role. A lot of that, and by the way, a lot of the government money in Germany is around two things. It's about getting SMEs engaged who can't afford it, and it's about building skill development. So there's sort of a public role there that complements the larger company role. SMEs, small manufacturing. Sorry, small and medium-sized enterprises okay. in, in the manufacturing sector. All right, so we just got to have a few more minutes here, but I'd like to ask you about how journalists can best cover these issues. Um, for starters, I mean, what in general do you think the media are missing on on, on big picture on these issues, and we kind of talked about the the uh, the focus on is it's just jobs or or it's just trade or it's just robots, and there there's some nuance that needs to be applied there. But are there other stories that are that are important that aren't getting coverage? For me, um, I think the the number one question about what's what's going to what's holding back manufacturing will allow it to recover is uh, unfair trade, as Rob said. I think it's, and, and, and the overall demand for manufactured goods. And that's a question I don't hear discussed anywhere uh, by journalists, is what's happening to real output, the real demand for goods produced here in the United States. And as I said, the, the, the single best thing we can do uh, to increase that demand is to, uh, is to fight unfair currencies, uh, unfair currency manipulation, and the consequences of that. We now have, uh, 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 these huge trade imbalances, and my estimates are that you would probably have to reduce the value of the U.S. dollar, uh, unfortunately, but you would have to do it, at least in the short term, uh, you have to reduce the dollar about 30% in value in order to raise the demand for U.S. manufactured goods. Uh, we've done that before. We did it in the mid-1980s. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that was something that was done under President Reagan. We could do it again. But the, the key there that should drive it is a desire to increase the demand for goods made here in the United States. Uh, the second uh, question is uh, infrastructure. You know, it's out there. We've been talking about it for years, but it's really a sort of a, uh, you know, issue comes up a few times a year. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a throwaway line. We need to really be focusing on it. And clean energy is a, is a tremendous opportunity for the future that's simply been written off, at least for the last year. But I think that's, it's, that's, that's critical. Uh, so for me, those are some key issues that we should be looking at. Okay, and Rob? Yeah, I think one of the, by the way, just on that point, we recently released a study that said, what if we eliminated the trade deficit in manufacturing? And, and you end up creating a, you know, millions of jobs. It's right. quite a big number. It uh, is. So here, I a couple of two things I think that the media, uh, the journalism, journalists could do better. One is just stop repeating the, these, these very shallow studies that, that, that I mean, I'm not repeating, but at least bring the other side in uh, more. Because oftentimes you'll read these studies, oh, it's all robots, it's all robots. And uh, when they talk about it, it might be trade, they sort of, it's, there's sort of an, as, uh, an aspersion that, well, these are protectionist or know-nothings. Right. Look, a lot of the people who are doing this work are very good scholars and they're not mm -hmm. know-nothings, and so let's have a more sophisticated debate. The second is move away from this Manichaeanism uh, on, on protectionism versus free trade. It's like, you, oh, well, this is protectionism. There's a third thing here, which is fighting mercantilism. That's not protectionism, and I think journalists tend to look at these in a black and white kind of way. The third would be there are a lot of stories that will say, okay, there's been a manufacturing resurgence in Kentucky or Ohio. There's huge... What they don't look at, though, is they don't look at, are these high road, what people call high road or low road? Yeah, I'm happy to believe we could create a million manufacturing jobs here at $8 an hour. I don't know why we'd want to, mm -hmm. but we could. That's not success. Success is creating the good manufacturing jobs that pay well, uh, are high value added, they're innovation based, at some, whether it's innovation in steel or innovation in biotech. And I think that that's a very interesting question for journalists to explore. And there have been some good studies, uh, good articles on that, but I think more could be done. Okay, and high road and low road, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, good, good ones that have Rob, good jobs. You can, you, you, I'm happy to, but you can... No, no, I, I, think, I think it's a key question. A high road is, involves, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously, uh, high skill yeah. uh, and lots of innovation and uh, uh, having uh, good worker management relationships at, at, the, at the floor level uh, and uh, using the latest technologies, which can be uh, uh, gleaned through these... Uh, uh, extension programs that, that, uh, that we have in small scale here, much larger scale in countries like Germany and Japan. Uh, so those things can all contribute to producing high value uh, uh, values of output per worker, which allow firms to pay workers more. Right. Uh, so you get most more advanced products, higher wages, it's a win-win outcome. Okay. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. I really want to thank you both for coming. Yeah.
And I want to thank you for joining us today from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation, where we make good journalists better. Today we've heard from two experts about the future of manufacturing in the U.S. I want to thank Rob Atkinson and Rob Scott for sharing their expertise with us. Find more webinars and reporting resources at nationalpress.org and follow us on Twitter at NatPress.